morning we're talking about the accursed thing. <clears throat> now, we see the word accursed, and we think we, we think we have a complete understanding of what it means. And we're all probably familiar with the account of Achan from the book of Joshua. If not, it can be found in Joshua chapter 6 and 7. But the accursed thing in Hebrew is one word. In English, it's accursed thing. But in Hebrew, that entire phrase means something dedicated or devoted. Well, that, that doesn't sound so bad. That, the word is translated as accursed. Why, why does it just mean something that's dedicated or devoted? Well, fact of the matter is, as Christians, we are called to be dedicated or devoted to God. <clears throat> but there's a problem. In our modern world, we don't understand the meaning of dedication and devotion. We don't understand what these words truly mean. We think we know what they mean, but we really don't have an understanding of what, what that word entails, what those words mean to us. We think it means that we're simply giving, some, giving something an important place of status in our lives. We say that we're devoted to a particular sports team, or we are dedicated to a hobby or a certain brand of vehicle. At the same time, we may claim to be dedicated or devoted to God and His will for our lives. We may claim dedication or devotion to any number of important things causes within the course of our lives. But by doing so, we proclaim our own ignorance and do despite to the worthy name of God. Another definition for the Hebrew word here translated as accursed is wholly given over to destruction, completely set apart to be destroyed. If there were any doubt, Jesus backed up this definition when he told his disciples that they should take up their crosses, and follow Him. There was no doubt in their minds what this meant. Uh, if, if this was spoken on today's term, uh, Jesus would have said, take up your electric chair and follow me. Literally. That's, that's what He was saying. It was the method of execution commonly used by the people of His time and in the area where He lived. If, uh, if common execution was a sword, He'd have said, take up your chopping block and follow me. Because what it was that he was saying was, you following me, chances are it's going to kill you. That's what it's going to take. You're going to have to let, let go of your life, let go of any control that you have over your life, and surrender it to me. <clears throat> Each of those 12 apostles suffered as a direct result of their absolute dedication to God. There's no doubt when we, when we see the history, when we see what the apostles went through, uh, from the extra-biblical record, from those things that we see historically, those things that the, the apostles suffered as a result of their faithfulness to God, we know that they were dedicated. There's no question about the extent of the dedication that they had for, for God's will in their lives. We read of divided hearts in God's Word and proclaim our absolute surrender to God. We claim undivided love, but often our, our lives betray our words. <clears throat> the lesson, this, this lesson really made me focus on myself. And I really didn't particularly like what I saw. We divide our time between secular and religious activities. When as a matter of course, there should be no such division. In fact, any such division weakens our relationships with God and increases our ties to this world and its coming destruction. Just as Achan, if we cling to any aspect of this world when the time comes, it will catch us off guard and unprepared for the return of Christ. We will become one with the accursed things of this world. That's why we are called to be in this world, but not of it. It's the reason Jesus said, a divided house can't stand. The same holds true whether speaking of Satan, or a local congregation, or even an individual whose heart is not truly dedicated to God, 
wholly sold out, wholly set apart to him and his will. Just a few verses from the Old Testament here. Deuteronomy 4 and 29. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. The verse doesn't end there. It says, if thou shalt seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Deuteronomy 10 and 12. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord God, thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God and to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul? Now, I just got curious about this, so I decided to count it up. The, the phrase, all thine heart, when it's talking about serving the Lord, is, is recorded seven times, and all your heart or hearts is recorded eight times. So we got. 15 times that we're instructed that it requires everything that's in us to serve the Lord. Not, uh, it's, uh, there was a, all is an important word. Uh, Brother Hammonds used to tell us 99 and 4 tenths percent won't do. It's all or nothing when it comes to our service to God. Are we all totally sold out to God's will today? If not, will we be found faithful? We don't know the day or the hour, so now is the time to be sure that we're 100% God's. If we do, if we will do that, then we can say with Jesus, as he said in John 14 and 30, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Can any of us say that right now? If not, we've got room to step up. We need to draw closer to God. If we desire to see those miracles taking place in the church like we've seen in the past, we've got to look into our own hearts. We've got to make sure that we are not a part of that accursed thing. We have to make sure that we are not the, the hindrance to the entire congregation. Achan was an, a hindrance to the entire nation of Israel. One man's sin affected the entire nation. Why, why can, how can we think that, well, this is just a little thing, I'm just a little person, we're just a little congregation. How can we think that our shortcomings won't affect the entirety of the congregation? How can we think that our shortcomings as an individual won't affect the entire church as a worldwide conglomeration. How can we think that when we look and we have this example of Achan in the Old Testament as an example of what happens when one person falls short? <clears throat> this lesson's precept deals with God's curse upon sin and sinning, and therefore upon sinners. In this late generation so far removed from the time when God's word, the Bible was spoken and written, people in general have come, come to deal with them with, with an alarming leniency. Even professing Christians through the cunning craftiness of Satan are bringing con eternal condemnation on themselves through the things which they allow or excuse <clears throat> in their beliefs and conducts in conduct. The prevailing cry for blessing tends to stop our ears to the curses defined as things that are damnable and abominable, bringing God's awful judgment upon the doers. This uh, particular phrase, the prevailing cry for blessings. Lord, send us blessings. Lord, bless this nation. Lord, bless our government. <clears throat> if we are unwilling to change, Blessings will not come. There's a song, a, a popular song came out a few years ago, and it talks about, oh, God, send your blessings on us. We're doing everything you told us to. Why don't you send your blessings on us? And every time I hear that song, it, it just it's like nails on a chalkboard because the people who wrote the song are ignorant of their own failures. They're looking for blessings, but they're not doing the things that will result in blessings. 
We just want to be blessed regardless of what we do as a nation. Nationally, we don't, we don't desire to do God's will. We just want to see His blessings come on us. And once again, I'm talking nationally. We, we want to see, well, this is the way I want it, so God, you bless this, because that's your job, God. You fix my problems. I'm having problems here, God. You need to fix my problems. That's not the way God works. We don't get to dictate God's will back to Him. We don't get to say, well, this is the way I want it, so now... Make it happen, God. What happens? It will bring God's awful judgment upon the doers. Now, before we move on, I think it's important that we understand just what sin is. Sin is not like a graded test where anything 70 or above is passing. That's good enough. The word translated as sin in the New Testament comes from archery, and it means to miss the mark. <clears throat> God's law is not like man's law, created by frail humans who are prone to make mistakes. God's law is perfect, and so is His judgment. <clears throat> Many feel justified in themselves when they break the speed limit because they know that most officers will not pull someone over for less than 5 or 10 miles over. This is a human flaw. There is a margin of error in recording speed. Uh, your speedometer may register just a little faster or just a little bit slower than the speed that you're actually traveling. And depending on the wear of your tires, if you have a brand new set of tires, it, your speedometer is going to register <coughs> differently than if you have a threadbare set of tires. And it could be the difference in several miles an hour. <coughs> the police know that. So if they clock you doing just a little over or a little under, well, they, they usually just let you go. And that's part of this frail humanity and, and uh, our, inability, our inability to act perfectly in a just manner. Because even though that uh, radar gun may be saying the absolute speed that that vehicle is going it's possible that radar gun may say something different than the speedometer simply because the variation in the speedometer, variation in the tires, any number of different uh, contributing factors can uh, adjust these things. So it's, it's, it's even possible that if you're doing three miles over the speed limit, the speedometer may say you're doing the speed limit, so you do five miles over the speed limit, now you're doing eight miles over the speed limit. Well, if you're in an area where a cop's going to pull you over for doing five over the speed limit, you're going to get pulled over even though, according to your speedometer, you thought you were safe because you were doing under, around five. What happens in this is uh, the margin of error is part of the reason that many people don't get speeding tickets and speed all the time. But this one little thing increases people's desires to push other limits. Well, if I can do this and get by with it, I can, I can do something else and get by. It's just a little bit. They say, well, it's, it's just a little thing. So, uh, I'm sure I've told a joke before. There's a lady pulled the speed, came up to a stop sign and didn't completely stop, just kind of slowed down and, and went on. Well, she got pulled over and, and she said, well, well, officer, I slowed down. And the officer pulled his, pulled his nightstick out and said, okay, if I start hit you on the head with this over and over, would you rather me slow down? Or would you rather me stop? There's a difference between slowing down and stopping. God is perfect in his justice. There's no margin of error when it comes to sin. It's right or wrong. He can never, God will never convict somebody unjustly of sin. There is no margin of error with God. It's either right or wrong. It's either good or bad. There is no gray area in the law of God, in the will of God. If I don't intentionally speed, it's not because I don't want to get a ticket. It's because I respect my God who has given me, given us men to put laws in place and to enforce them. The Bible tells us to obey the laws of the land. If I don't, then I'm not only disrespecting the government, I'm disrespecting God 
who provided that government to me. The Bible tells us there's not a, there's not a power in place that God didn't put there, good or bad. There've been uh, Wendy and I have talked about it many times. Uh, there are good kings and there are bad kings. God put every one of them in charge. God allowed them to be placed, and it wasn't just over the land of Israel. Uh, to this day, there's not a power that sits on the face of this earth. We can cry, well, I don't like this president. I don't like that president. Well, guess what? God's the one who put them in. You might have cast the vote, but God's the one who said, this is the one who's going to be in charge for the time. Uh, it doesn't matter what you like. <laughs> It doesn't matter what you want. I don't like the things that are going on in this nation any more than anybody else. But I know that the Bible has told me for quite some time it's been clear in my mind that things are going to get worse. What we're seeing is what Paul has told us, what Jesus has told us. What we've seen in the Word of God is taking place. That's a scary thing. But what that means is we need to be where we need to be. I can't fix the government. I can't fix the, the speedometer so it works the same no matter what. I, I can't fix these things. But what I can do, what I have the ability to do, is cry out to God and ask Him to search my heart and show me where I'm coming up short so that I can step up to where He would have me to be and be what He would have me to be. I can't fix anybody else. I can't change anybody else. But if I can live the example 100% as God would have me to, then I can be an example to others. Then I can be a blessing to others by allowing God to have that freedom to work in me. Yes? These things that's happening around the world should not be there to scare us. Right. Because we know that God's got it all in control. But if we had had these things happening in government, we would not see how close God's return is. And maybe be lax in some of it. To me, this is more of an encouragement Absolutely. to say, God's getting ready to come. And you better make sure you're ready. Oh. These things are going to happen in our lives. I don't like babies being killed. Nope. But this is things that are happening because this is the plan of God. Right. Now why it is, I don't know. But there is a result that God's getting to mm -hmm. in this world. I think and getting us to, and it might be, and it probably is more than likely just to get us to fall upon our knees and pray and seek him a closer walk right. so that we can be ready for these things as they come. We shouldn't be surprised. And like I said, we mm -hmm. shouldn't be worried right. or concerned because it's in God's plan. So, and we have to accept God's plan and be ready when he comes that we are ready right. and that we are able to help those, lead everybody else that we can mm -hmm. to be ready. And so, you know, this is happening because of God's plan. Yep. He's allowing these things to happen so that we right. can be where we need to be with the Lord. If everything was fine and dandy, a lot of people would not look to the Lord. Right. We see that constantly mm -hmm. in our society. Absolutely. We just got a video the other day of, uh, Brother Jason sent it, and I want to show it sometime, of uh, a church in Cambodia where they're at right now. He said, no air conditioner, no chairs, over 90 degrees. They're sitting on the floor worshiping the Lord. And he right. said, oh. basically, Lord help us. Right. A... And you see the church, the, the chairs aren't even, we've got heat and air here, yeah. we've got lights, we've got chairs that are fairly comfortable. Air and air conditioning and heat. It rained a little bit today. Oh, I bet some of those people have walked in the rain before we right. go to church. Poor rain. And this is just trying to get our attention. Right. These things that's happening in the world is trying to help us to get closer to the Lord. There's a passage just came to mind talking about the things that are going on. I believe the Bible says, lift up your heads. Your redemption draweth nigh. It's, it's drawing close. And it's our responsibility to prepare ourselves if we will be the examples we need to be as individuals, then we can make a difference. We can be an influence on those around us, whether they're in our families or strangers on the street. <clears throat> we're too busy worrying about what's going on in a worldly worry. In our own minds, in our in own, own houses, mind, in our own families. Then we can't do the work of the Lord. Right. Because we're so caught up in all of that mess that 
that we can't go and witness to others because we're worried about what's going to happen to me next, what's going to happen here, mm-hmm. what's going to happen now, what's going to happen on the news next. But when we look to the Lord and say, Lord, God, and help me to be a witness to right. these people mm-hmm. around me, that they can be ready for you. Sin is either sin or it's not sin. The line is clear as black and white. Now back to the archery analogy, you either hit the target or you don't. The fact of the matter is righteous living is a small target. One that's impossible to hit without God's continual help in our lives each and every day. Righteousness isn't something that you pick up when you get the Holy Ghost and you just walk out and everything's fine for the rest of your life. It's a choice that you have to make. Uh, Paul said, I die daily. Every day we have to look and we have to see those choices that are going to lead us astray. See those things that are trying to pull us down and move away from them. Step away from them. Go in the other direction. Find God's will, whatever it may be, however difficult it may be, and do it. Because I don't know about you, I'm probably not the only one, but I found when, when God asks me to do something difficult and I have a hard time starting out, it's just the starting out that's hard. But as soon as I take that first step, as soon as in my own strength I choose to say, this is the way I'm going because God told me to go this way. As soon as I, to, I, I make that decision and start that motion, God immediately takes over and gives me the strength to get through and do whatever it is that I need to. As long as I look at that way and say, I don't think I can do it. It's too hard, God. I can't. I never will. I, I, I want to do your will, God, but I, I don't want to do that. I want to do your will, God, but can I do it my way instead? That doesn't work. If we lay aside God for a moment, we've already missed the mark. Consider the apparent nearness of the end. It seems increasingly important that we we be made aware of the curses which threaten our eternal salvation, those which impose themselves on on us in this life if we allow them to. And the final curse of everlasting torment torment, if we fail to avail ourselves of God's mighty redemption through Jesus Christ our Lord. Golden Truth, Joshua 6 and 18. I'm going to read this a couple of times differently. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed. When ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Now, I want to read this just a little bit differently this time, but it's, it's just changing the word who, uh, that, dis, that uh, definition we talked about of a cursed, just a little bit, that accursed thing. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the thing that is set apart for utter destruction, lest ye make yourselves set apart for utter destruction. When ye take of the thing set apart for utter destruction and make the camp of Israel set apart for utter destruction and trouble it. It's what the Word is telling us here. It's talking specifically to those children of Israel. But everything in the Bible is for our learning and admonition. It's for our strength and growth. It's for our understanding of our own lives in these modern days. It doesn't have anything to do with me. I don't have a I don't have an enemy coming against me. I don't have uh, an enemy that I have to go against and worry about taking stuff out of the camp that I'm told not to take. We do. It's just not a physical enemy. And the things that we take and the things that we have the potential to fill our lives with are not necessarily a Babylonish garment or silver or gold. But the results are the same. The, the last word here, and trouble it, I just I want to point out, we're talking about Achan here. The word trouble uh, is akar in Hebrew. And that's very closely related to the word akin. Akar means to stir up trouble. Akin means one who stirs up trouble. And that's exactly what he did by his failure to recognize the importance of keeping his eyes focused on God's will. 
He stirred up trouble for the entire nation. Part one, an admonition from the past. God's precepts are eternal. Joshua 6, 17 through 19, And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein. Excuse me. To the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are in her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. That we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed. When ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel accursed to trouble it, but all the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron are consecrated. That word means holy. All these things are holy unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So when Achan stole, he was stealing directly from God. In Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 10, 11 and 12, Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. That's us. Wherefore, let him thinketh that he stand, take heed lest he fall. Now, why would these two verses go together? Because they apply. If we, don't, if we overlook our part in the Old Testament, how the Old Testament applies to us, we will think that we stand and we'll end up falling. We have the potential, if we don't recognize how we fit in with the Old Testament Scriptures, to come up to, at the end of the line and, and say, didn't we do these things in your name, God? Didn't we do mighty works? And him say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. We have that potential. If we fail to recognize how these things in the Bible apply to our lives today. When Joshua had taken Moses' place and the children of Israel had crossed the Jordan River in the land of promise, they faced their first conquest, the taking of the city of Jericho. The Lord gave Joshua specific instruction. Being in the enemy territory, Jericho was accursed along with everything therein. If they should take for themselves anything at all, they would bring a curse upon the whole camp of Israel. On the seventh day, the walls of the city fell down flat, and all appeared to have been an overwhelming victory. This last sentence takes us right back to 1 Corinthians 10 and 12. Let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. It's not about what we think of ourselves. It's not about what we think of others that matter. It's only what God clearly sees that will matter in the end. The only way for us to know where we stand with God is to go to the source. The heart is, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We can't even know our own hearts. Uh, Nick and I were uh, speaking last night and the heart is so deceitful it can, we can think that we're doing something for a right reason but our heart has us deceived. Our, in our hearts, we're doing something so that we can receive from it. But even our minds is con, are convinced that we're doing these things for the right cause. Like the people that will kill you thinking that they do God a service. It, absolutely. Absolutely. Only once again, what God sees in the end will matter. If we ask God in earnest and are willing to hear the reply... God will give us what we ask. Like I said, sometimes it's hard when God says, I need you to let go of this. Sometimes it's hard when God says, I need you to do this. Instead of doing that, sometimes these things are difficult. But God's not trying to make our life difficult. He's trying to do what's best for us. A, a parent doesn't say to their child, don't play in the street because... <laughs> They want their, their child's life to be more difficult. Parent says don't play in the street because they don't want to see their child hurt. God says do this, don't do that because he knows the outcome. We look at it, we think we know what's going to happen, but we don't have a clue. We don't have an understanding. That's why we go to God. God, how do I handle this situation? God, what, do, what choice would you have me to make? God, what is it in my life that's hindering me from being the witness, the example, the minister whom you would have me to be? He will receive, reveal our shortcomings before they can become sin if we'll let Him. 
If we'll just let him, if we'll just let him point these things out to him, if we'll cry out to him and, and Lord, help me. Help me to see and give me the strength to let go, to cling, whatever it takes to find your perfect will so that I am not the one who brings a curse on my local congregation, on the, on the state, the church throughout the state, throughout the nation, throughout the world. I don't want to be the one who's being a hindrance. Part two, the curse of covetousness. One man sins, all suffer. Joshua 7, 1, 12, 20, and 22, 21. But the children of Israel committed a trespass and the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except you destroy the cursed from among you. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and I took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. The curse of sin can create a state of general confusion. Transferring this incident by analogy to the church, the defeat and flight of Israel's soldiers appeared in the public eye to Israel's sin and God's anger nationally. When we look at our lives today, when we look at what's happening right now, if somebody comes into our midst and they're not of us and they see division and confusion, are they going to desire to be a part of this congregation? No, there's plenty of division and confusion in, at, the work, at, at their workplace. There's plenty of division and confusion at, at, in their houses, uh, wherever, uh, among their friends. Why would they desire more of these difficult things to be in their lives? And when that, church, when that individual looks on, in on us from the outside and they see, well, the, no miracles taking place in that church either. They're talking all about these miracles, but I don't see any miracles taking place in that church. Once again, is that going to draw those souls to us when that's what they see? No, it's not. It's going to push them farther away. The church is one body, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. 1 Corinthians 12, 26, regardless of the cause. In the case of sin, the whole church suffers reproach until the matter is fully resolved. And those who are responsible to exercise church government must not delay in bringing reproachful matters to a just conclusion. Until this is done, God will withdraw his favor. When God's covenant is transgressed, some cursed thing is stolen and the matter is dissembled, hypocritically covered up by lying or false impression. God's order is to get up get to the bottom of the trouble, admin, administer discipline of judgment in accordance with the crime. In the situation with Achan, 36 men lost their lives as a result of one man's failure. So many times you hear people say, well, well this that I'm doing, it just affects me. It doesn't affect anybody else. It just affects my health. It just affects my life. It doesn't affect anybody else. Nobody sins in a vacuum. The things that we do have an effect on those around us. In this instance, 36 families lost husbands, brothers, uncles, fathers, and sons. One man sinned, but the innocent were destroyed because Achan had an issue with covetousness. He didn't commit murder or some other violent crime. He simply saw the spoils of war and was seized by them. Too often we think of our own failures as inconsequential. Oh, that, I did that, but it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's nothing compared to what this other person did. Surely God will overlook my fault since, since their faults are so much bigger than mine. Now, this may occasionally work in our modern justice system, but this is not how God operates. We are responsible for our own behavior, and if we fail, 
others may have to pay the price for our sins. Perhaps it could be, even be one of our loved ones who suffer because of our misdeeds. Achan's family was put to death with him when he failed to submit to God's will. Who will feel the heat if we come up short? Who's going to suffer if I don't do God's will? We may not like the answer when the time comes. If we do, step off the straight and narrow way. We may not like the outcome. <clears throat> it's true that mercy and long-suffering should be used, but not for too long and, and without respect of persons. For the church is suffering, if, for the church is suffering unjustly if matters are unduly delayed. When the local church must wonder why God's blessings, why God is not blessing, it may be necessary to cease using wisdom and mercy for an excuse and give God the opportunity to bring about a confession from, from perhaps one member who is under his curse. Now, I had to stop here and read twice. It, it says, uh, stop using wisdom and mercy. Well, when are we ever stop, supposed to stop using wisdom and mercy? We're not ever to stop using wisdom and mercy. The lesson says, stop using wisdom and mercy as an excuse for inaction. Stop using wisdom and mercy for an excuse to allow sin to continue. <clears throat> when sin is allowed to continue, it gives a false sense of security to that guilty party. When justice fails to be implemented. When souls sin and don't immediately feel the sting of conviction or receive swift consequences for their actions, they begin to justify their own behavior. This only brings about more unacceptable behavior. We read in Ecclesiastes 8 and 11, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Because we don't receive that punishment immediately. Because well, I, I can imagine the, the children of Israel going to one of their uh, neighboring nation pagan God's temples and saying, oh, I don't know if I should do this. Everyone says I should do this. I don't know if I should do this. God said I shouldn't do this. And, and they go in there and they sacrifice to that, that false god, that, 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 that idol standing up in that temple. And, well, where's the lightning? Why, why didn't I just fall down dead? Well, it must be okay if I do this. Because if it wasn't okay, I, I'd just been struck down dead right then. <clears throat> well, well, then it must be okay. So then the next time, they don't even think twice about it. They just go and do it. And it's the same way in our lives today. We think, well, I don't know if I should do that. We've got that, we've got that conscious in us guiding us. We've got the Spirit leading us even when we're not filled with the Spirit. The Spirit, that's who leads us to the altar in the first place. The Spirit will guide us. He'll give, he, he, God has allowed us to have this conscience to, to give us understanding of what we should and shouldn't do. And when we go against our conscience and nothing immediately happens, yeah, it was nothing. It was just all in my head. I can go ahead and do this. It's fine. It doesn't matter. Now, I'm talking about anything. Now, I'm talking about stealing a piece of candy to, to going out and killing somebody. These are the things that go through the minds of men and women in this world today. Well, I... I didn't get in trouble for it, so it must be okay. That's why it says they see the conscience with a hot iron. Absolutely. When failures occur, we must be quick to recognize them and repent. If we don't, we will only cre increase our own suffering and the suffering of those around us. I look at King Saul and King David. Neither one of them were great people. Both of them had plenty of failures. But the difference is when King Saul's failures were pointed out to him, he accused everybody but himself because it couldn't be him. When David was, David's failures were pointed out, he immediately recognized his failures and repented and turned away. And we see <clears throat> that anything that David did once and was reproved for it, he didn't have to worry about him doing that again. It was done. He recognized his sin and he repented of it, which means he turned around and went the other way. Saul, on the other hand, had a little bit of an obedience problem, a little bit of a patience problem, and he continued to have those throughout his reign, throughout his life.
to delay the punishment could make the, the negligent one an accessory to the case. Now God sent Ezekiel as a watchman to the children of Israel. He was told, Ezekiel was told to warn the people of their wicked ways. By doing so, by warning the people, he was delivering his own soul. He was delivering himself from condemnation, from destruction. Since God told them that if he didn't warn the people and they perished in their sins, then their blood would be on his hands. He was responsible. You ever hear a, a minister say, I've delivered my soul? He's not saying, I've given you everything I got. And if he is, then he has a misunderstanding of that phrase. I've heard it said, and I, that's what I've thought that people meant when I realized what, it was, what they were saying. It's like it, it took on a whole new meaning. I've delivered my soul. I've told you what God has told me to tell you. If you don't apply it to your lives, your blood's on your own hands. I've done my part. I've delivered my soul. In this instance, Ezekiel would have been responsible for their demise. We, each and every one of us, stand as watchmen in Ezekiel's stead today. If you are a member of the church of God, you are responsible to be a benefit one to another. We are called to help one another, to encourage one another, to strengthen one another in God's will for our lives. How are we going to respond? Are we going to allow God to use us to be a blessing one to another? Or are we going to be found responsible for the loss of those? Uh, there have been some, and I, I regret it to this day, that they've left the church. And I feel directly responsible for it. I wasn't spiritually where I needed to be. I didn't, I didn't have the understanding at the time. And when they left, I thought, well, I saw it coming. We should never say, I saw it coming. If we see it coming, we need to do something about it. We need to act. We need to, to reach out, even if there's no response from the individual, even if they're unwilling to return. We've done our part. If we haven't, we're guilty. The other accursed things, part three, a failure in love. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. Anybody know what that means? What about the last word? That's, you got part of it. Maranatha. That's exactly right. What this, what this, I don't, and Nick and I spoke about this last night, and I still don't know why it wasn't translated, but what this says in English, if it was just read out completely, it says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be set apart for destruction at the return of the Lord. So when Jesus Christ comes, if you're not ready, you're going to be accursed. That's exactly right. First, to love not the Lord Jesus Christ is to be unsaved, lost. It must be said and acknowledged that there is a profession of love for Christ that is not love. It's easy to say, I love you. Those words are not any more difficult to form than I hate you. <laughs> Those words just work. They're, they're not difficult to pronounce. But they are difficult to to prove if that's all it is, is just words. That's exactly right. We have to love indeed. If we love God, we're not just going to love, oh, I love you, I praise you, Lord, and then go out and do stuff we should not do. Loving God could include those things, the praising and the worshiping, but it will also include a life that is clearly dedicated to God. This is the ultimate and true test of salvation. Jesus said, if, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is how we can tell in our own lives if we are living to God's will, living up to God's will, and if we do truly love the Lord. Do we keep all of His commandments? If we only keep a majority of them, then we really don't love Him. Our love is made manifest by our complete obedience. I am running quickly out of time. <clears throat> I want to make clear that there are plenty of churches who say they have the full gospel, 
But the full gospel doesn't just mean the, full, the, the main point, sanctification, salvation, the Holy Ghost baptism, church membership, etc. We need to know the fullness of all the details and the rest that's in between. <clears throat> Malachi recorded the words of God, the very words of God. They are plain and simple. Pay tithes or be cursed with a curse. Be it an individual, a local church, or this whole nation. All it takes... This is what this whole lesson is about. All it takes is one person falling short to hinder the work of an entire congregation. Each of us bear the responsibility to one another for our unified well-being. We owe it one to another to make sure that we are where we need to be, that I, need, I, need, I am where I need to be. Each and every one of us, I'm talking about myself here, each and every one of us have to do is say, Lord, just like the disciples at the Last Supper, is it me? Is it me? Am I the one that's causing this problem? Am I the one that's coming up short? I can't fix. I can encourage. I, I, can, I can help. I can lead, but I can't fix. And it could be just one person. I don't want that. You know, it could it, be me. I, and that's, that's my point. That's my point. We each, as individuals, have to recognize the importance of, of this lesson and how it applies to our lives. We have to understand that this isn't about looking out at those around us because it's real easy. That's, that's what Saul did. Well, look at, look at them. This is about, Lord, help me. Show me. Show me myself, Lord, so that I can see. Help me to see me through your eyes, God so that I can see where I'm coming up short. Because I don't, think, I don't think it's any one individual in this congregation that's causing the problem. It's probably all of us. It, it may well be all of us. But if we're all working on ourselves, if we all commit <clears throat> as members of the church of God right. to commit to work on ourselves, mm -hmm. if each one of us is doing that right. as a body, mm -hmm. not only to God, but to help each other out. Right. Because there might be a time... Sister Pulliam needs me. Exactly. But if I've not got myself together, there's no way I can help her. Right. And there's no way I can be a witness to bring somebody in. Exactly. So I have to work on Wendy, and mm -hmm. if Sister Pulliam works on Sister Pulliam, then we can all come together in unity. Yeah. The, the problem is human nature finds it much easier to point out the flaws of others than to recognize flaws of ourselves. It, it's, it's uh, Paul talked about if we compare ourselves among ourselves, we're not wise. We, we have to look at ourselves. We have, this, this isn't an out, outside walk. This, isn't, this is a walk of faith. We have to look at ourselves. We have to look inside. Lord, if, if I'm coming up short, show me where it is. If I'm How not... Times, Brother Chris, when the, whoever it is, <laughs> when sin is revealed, mm -hmm. God dealt, God calls, well, he told Joshua, Face right. Deal with. Right. You know, there comes a time God will deal mm -hmm. with sin. Absolutely. And will be revealed. That's 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 a sad truth, and and it's happened many times in the past. I mean, this situation with Achan is just just one of many instances where God has revealed sin. And the Bible tells us, be sure that your <clears throat> sin will find you out. There's there's no doubt about it. Whether in this life or the one to come, we're going we're gonna to be ashamed of those things that we didn't get right. How much better is it to make sure that I'm where I need to be right now before that judgment comes, before it's too late? And, and like I said, I'm not pointing my finger at anybody but myself here because that's, that's what this is about. This is about an inward look. This, this whole entire lesson, the cursed thing, was about looking at ourselves, recognizing our own shortcomings, and allowing God to clean us up and do His work. And like I said in the last lesson, there are many things that we may do that aren't necessarily sin, but they're hindrance. <coughs> they're a hindrance we, to our spiritual walk. That's why we look at ourselves before we take the communion, so we don't get condemned by the Lord yeah. for taking His blood. Yeah, that's, that's one thing I... I don't like, uh, I, that's one thing I don't like. I think it's in the advice to members that says, check yourself occasionally. I don't like that. I think we need to check ourselves daily, <laughs> hourly, as often as it takes to make sure that we are where we need to be. I'm sorry, I've got five minutes into you there. <clears throat>